Good day. Oh, here we are. Man, where is time flying? We're in the middle of April. It's crazy, crazy. But the weather here where I live in central Alberta and Canada, it's uh, starting to really be a lot warmer during the day. The days are much longer. And uh, it's just really spring is starting to show, show itself in, in many different ways. I hope you've been able to um, uh, reflect on the Easter season and look forward to the days ahead, uh, the days to come. Dictionary.com defines pride in a few ways. For example, there is civic pride. You know, the pride that we have in our communities, pride in the service of others. There is the state or feeling of being proud. And then there's a kind of pride that is one of a high or excessive opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or achievements. The Bible has plenty to say about the kinds of pride. The Bible teaches us there is a difference between the kind of pride God hates and, for example, the kind of pride we would feel for a job well done. Or the kind of pride we can feel over the achievements of others, especially those we know and care about. For example, my son uh, just recently graduated from college. Pretty proud of the guy. But the kind of pride that finds its root in conceit and self-righteousness, this kind of pride God hates. Why? Because it will hinder our ability to seek after God. The psalmist uh, said in Psalm 10, 4, In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Friends, this is a kind of pride that was at work in the lives of King David's and Bathsheba's choices, which, as the Bible reveals, resulted in tragic consequences. And this is the kind of pride that can be found in our lives. After all, I didn't really react in anger. Or taking that second glance, that can't possibly be wrong. This is the kind of pride that is made manifest when we think we are more capable in our abilities than we are. Therefore, we assume or we make the decision we don't need anyone else. This is the kind of pride in a deceptive way is made manifest when our desire is for more independence and self-sufficiency from God. This is the kind of pride that makes you and me the heroes of our own stories. Look how wise I am. Look how much smarter I am. Look how my choices are better. Just look at, just look at how much better I am, period. Well, friends, the Bible has a word to describe this kind of sinful pride. The Bible calls it foolishness. And how easy it is for us to look at others and think, how foolish so-and-so was. What were they thinking? Do they think they can get away with that? Well, all the time, our pride blinds us to the foolishness in our own lives. Please turn in your Bibles to chapter 6 of Galatians. And we'll be reading from verse 1 through to 10. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Verse 6. Let no one who is taught the word share all the good things. Let me repeat that. Pardon me. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mock. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, well from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit, well from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, 
Let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, now as we move into the church uh, calendar, into the new year, so to speak, of the church. We thank you for the spring, and soon the flowers will be popping up, and the trees will be budding, and all that wonderful thing, Lord. And we thank you so much for that. And we just ask by your Spirit that you help us uh, understand this text as we look at, uh, it, at it in depth, and not only understand, but to put it into action. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Three weeks ago, we pressed pause on our sermon series, Galatians for Freedom. And today, as you may have noticed, we resume our study with the intention to finish by end of April. Our focus today will be on Galatians chapter 6, but predominantly in the first five verses. The Apostle Paul here is winding up his letter with encouragement uh, to the Galatian believers to bear one another's burdens. And this was in keeping with the freedom the Galatian believers had received when they believed Paul's gospel, the crucified Christ. A freedom which encompassed a willingness to obey the word of God, that is to love and serve one another, thereby fulfilling the command of God, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you see this in Galatians 5.14. And I hope, over the, I hope that over the past few months, you've had a the opportunity to read through this marvelous letter at least once, but hopefully more than once. And you, and in doing so, you may have discovered a number of things, but I hope you've discovered the reason uh, that Paul had decided to write to the churches in Galatia. And one can boil it down and put it this way. False teachers, in their desire to make something of themselves and discrediting, trying to discredit Paul, were bringing to the Galatian believers another gospel, which we learned in chapter 1 was no gospel at all, and thereby laying on the Galatians a burden. We know from church history that from the very beginning, the church would be challenged from many fronts and not the least from within. We keep in mind that the churches Paul had planted in Galatia, which is today modern-day Turkey, were primarily of the Gentile persuasion, that is, they were not Jewish, and Gentiles, who were under the burden of sin and death, just like all of us also were. Gentiles caught up in the world of serving and worshiping a pantheon of gods. They were idol worshipers. Then one day, God in his mercy and grace sent Paul and he preached the gospel. It was a gospel of forgiveness and of love and of righteousness and freedom. Freedom from the burden of sin and death and so much more. The Galatians' spiritual burdens had been lifted from them by Christ himself. Now, as we have seen in Paul's letter, some had been convinced that they needed Jesus plus something else. And in this case, it was the Mosaic Law, and particularly for the male Galatians' circumcision. What happened? Well, Paul would go on to say in the first chapter, verse 6, I am astonished, astonished, that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Then Paul will go on in chapter 3, verse 1, and say this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? In other words, who has beguiled you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, I wonder if we understand the implication of this for the Galatian believers, which in a way is the same for us as well today. What the Galatian believers had received and believed was nothing of their own making, nothing of their own doing, as it was in our lives as well. It was all the work of God in Christ, my friends. Paul would say in chapter 5, verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Paul didn't set them free. Christ had set them free. And the Judaizers, these false Jewish teachers, in teaching that the Galatians needed Jesus plus something else, were piling on to the Galatians a burden. You know, folks, I don't think it's any different today in the evangelical church. I can't speak about other, uh, other churches, but the evangelical stream of Christian churches. 
How quickly many forget that Christ has set them free. And let me ask you this question. Do you know that you are free? Or does it feel like a burden to serve God? Have, has someone placed a burden on you to serve God? Is someone teaching you and preaching something that is becoming a burden to serve you? You feel that you can never measure up. But I've got news for you. You can't measure up. Remember who set you free, Christ. Or maybe you think that you're not like those other sinners over there. You know, those ones. I've got news for you. Yes, you are. We sinners are all alike. I found some lyrics from a song that is a wonderful song, Christ is All in All, that kind of puts things in perspective for us. And it goes something like this. Brothers, sisters, built upon this cornerstone, for Christ is all in all. Bound together by his blood, rooted in his love, where Christ is all in all. Standing in one faith, one Lord, one holy accord, where Christ is all in all. Remember who set you free. It was Christ that set you free. So when we consider the text before us, Paul exhorts the Galatians to do to, do to those who were caught in sin what Christ did for you and me and for the Galatians to restore them. You see this in verse 1. Please notice, Paul's desire was to ease the burden of the Galatians. The Judaizers, in teaching the necessity of the law, were in effect adding to their burden. You know, friends, when you and I break God's law, that which is called sin in the Bible is its very own burden. And Paul, here in the text, would not have been pointing to those who are in all-out rebellion toward God and happy to do so. We can also reason and say Paul was not pointing to the pagans as well. To put it plainly, Paul was most like was, had Paul had in mind people just like you and me. You know the everyday, get up in the morning, go to work or go somewhere else, go to sleep at night and repeat believer. Well, let me put this in biblical terms. The believer has placed their faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Who upon getting up in the morning decides by faith to live by the Spirit. And as best as they can, keep in step with the Spirit. That's chapter 5, verse 25. The one who reads their Bible, prays, and gathers as often as possible with their brothers and sisters in Christ to worship and receive the sacraments. This would have been in the mind of Paul when he said in verse 1, if anyone is caught in any transgression, which is the same as saying sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Please notice who Paul said should restore those caught in any sin. Who? You who are spiritual. You who are spiritual. We ask the question, what does this mean? We go to Paul's commentary in his first letter to Corinthians to help us understand. There Paul said, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are a folly to him, and he is not able to understand them, understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? And then Paul would say, but we have the mind of Christ. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. My friends, a natural person here speaks of the unregenerated person. The person that is described by Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. And it goes like this. Paul would say they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. My friends, this is simply the condition of everyone in the world without Christ. Paul was not expecting the unbeliever to restore the one caught in sin. No, they would be spiritually discerned. Paul was talking to the one who has known the grace and the mercy and kindness of God through Christ for their own sins, who knows their own weaknesses. The one Paul exhorts, this is the one that Paul exhorts to restore their brothers and sisters. 
When we look at this word restore, the meaning of the original Greek for restore, when it was used in those days in the secular Greek, refers to a medical term for setting a fracture or a broken bone. One would be wise to have the bone attended to so it can be restored to its original health and condition. Friends, restoring a brother or sister caught in any sin needs to be attended to. It mustn't be ignored. The brother or sister is not to be excused, left off the hook, but they're also not to be ruined. The goal always is restoration. Now, I'm not sure about your experience in the church, but restoration of brothers or sister caught in sin is, in church, is often ignored. Or it can go all the way one direction, all the way the other direction. In one way, we can put blinders on and pretend the sin never happened and let it continue, kind of brush it under the carpet. And that never, done, that never bodes well. Or we can go all the way the other direction and respond harshly toward the one who has sinned, very harshly. Then we can gossip, we can do a lot of things. But friends, hence the reason Paul would say to the Galatians, you who are spiritual need to deal with this appropriately. You who are spiritual. And how do we do that? Is the next question. Well, by restoring the brother or sister in the spirit of gentleness. Verse 1 still. And when we read this, our mind should automatically go back to chapter 5, verse 22. We've been there in this series. Paul there presented in chapter 5 a contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And gentleness is an ingredient of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that every believer who is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit can manifest outwardly. And when we look at the second half of verse 1, it reminds us that as we keep in step with the Holy Spirit, gently restoring our brothers and sisters, gently and allowing our brothers and sisters to restore us, we do so knowing our own weaknesses and sinfulness. And that will help us and protect us from the temptation of pride and, and even the temptation of the brother or sister, uh, the one that they had yielded to that we're dealing with. And Paul moves now into verse 2. And there he said, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So let's just break down. Let's do the first half and then the second half. Notice, bear one another's burdens. The verb translated bear, and no, that's not a brown bear or a black bear. This is the word bear. Here it is in an imperative mood. It's a command, my friends. Paul, in, ins- in essence, what he's doing here is repeating what he already said earlier in the letter in chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. There Paul said, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now James, in his letter, puts it this way. James said this, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. James 2, 8. Here Paul, in his letter, in Galatian, Galatian letter here, and, in James, and James in his letter are quoting from Leviticus 19.18. So the point is that it's self-evident. It's staring right at, right at us. The Galatian believers, in obedience to the commands of God, demonstrate their love and gentleness by lifting some of the weight from their brothers and sisters, those who have become burdened and in danger of collapsing, whatever that may be, whether it's sin or something else. And in this instruction here from Paul and James, we hear the echo of Jesus' own words when he said this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. 
So when we bear one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. And considering the meaning here of the law of Christ, there really is no specific set of verses or a verse that clarifies this for us, but it can be summed up for us by Jesus again with his own words, where he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest, this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So friends, when we obey God's command to love him and others, our lives and the lives of those around us will be impacted and even changed. For when we love each other as Jesus loved us, Jesus tells us that all people will know that we are his disciples. That is, if we love one another. John 13, 35. Now having said this, we often encounter a problem. And what might that be, you ask? Well, if you look at verse 3, it tells us who and what the problem is. And I think you figured it out. You and me, people, are the who, and self-deception and conceit is the what. Let's read verse 3 together. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. He deceives himself. Paul here, using a conventional, using conventional wisdom to support his instruction to mutual love of one another, Paul reminds us, Paul reminds us of this in his first letter to the Church of Corinth when he said, If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. And these two verses together uncover the universal desire of all people, that includes you and me, to feel special. And we see this desire uh, to sort of made manifest of the desire to be famous according to the world's standards. And isn't this what we do? If we can't be there, we do it with others. We put people on pedestals. You know, the gifted athlete. You know, that, that guy that reached 160 points in one season. Wow, how awesome they are. Whew. Special, special. The gifted entertainer, the gifted pastor, the teacher and, politician, and politicians. Pardon me. Then there's the others. Well, not so much those ones, right? You know, the mentally ill, the physically deformed, the unwanted child. These and the other unwanted ones, we don't give them the time of day. Not a thought, not a care. Let me ask you then, how then can we obey the command of God to love our neighbor, neighbor uh, as ourselves if we get to pick who we love? Paul said this very clearly, For by the grace given to me I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Let love be genuine. Abhor, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 all the way to 21. So wrapping up now uh, his instruction, Paul reminded the Galatians to test their own lives. Paul put it this way in his uh, Corinthian letter. Second Corinthian letter, he said, examine yourselves. And you need to ask why. Well, he would go on to say, to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test? I just want to ask you a question. Um, have you ever asked yourself what your motives are for helping others? What is behind your motives? Are you really, maybe, seeking to feel special? You know, do you want your picture on the cover? You want to buy five copies for your mother? You want to see your smiling face on the cover of the Rolling Stone? Well, friends, here's the point of the text. When you and I walk in the grace of Christ, when we truly do that, we will no longer desire the need to feel special. We will no longer compare ourselves to others. We will no longer put someone on a pedestal. When we test our attitudes and our behaviors by the biblical principles and commands that we find 
in the scripture, we will then truly understand that God loved us first. And then we are free to love one another. So in summation, we by faith, in the power of the Holy Spirit, will take the responsibility then for our own lives before God. I just want to share this story in closing. His name was Bill. He was in his early 20s and had wild hair and he wore a t-shirt with holes in it, blue jeans and no shoes. This was literally his wardrobe for his entire four years of college. He was a brilliant student, but kind of esoteric. A very, very bright young man. He became a Christian while attending college. And across the street from the campus was a church with a very well-dressed, very conservative congregation. They wanted to develop ministry to students, but were not sure how to go about it. One Sunday, Bill decided to go there. He walked in with no shoes, jeans, his t-shirt, and wild hair. The service had already started, and Bill started down the aisle looking for a seat. The church was completely packed, and he couldn't find a seat. By then, people were, lit, were really looking a bit uncomfortable, but no one said anything. Bill got closer and closer to the pulpit, and when he realized there were no seats, he just squatted down right on the carpet. By then, the people were really uptight, and the tension in the air was thick. About that time, the minister realized that from way, back, way at the back of the church, a deacon was slowly making his way toward Bill. Now, the deacon was in his 80s, and he had silver-gray hair and three-piece suit. He was a godly man, very elegant, very dignified, very courtly. He walked with a cane. And as he started walking toward this boy, everyone was saying to themselves that you can't blame him for what he was going to do. How could you expect a man of his age and of his background to understand some college kids sitting on the floor in a church? It took a long time for the man to reach the boy. The church was utterly silent except for the clicking of the man's cane. All eyes were focused on him. You couldn't even hear anyone breathing. The minister couldn't even preach the sermon until the deacon did what he had to do. And now they saw this elderly man drop his cane on the floor. With great difficulty, the old man lowered himself and sat down next to Bill and worshipped with him so Bill wouldn't be alone. Paul said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this message. I pray, God, that we would allow your word and we allow your spirit to just search our hearts, check our motivations and attitudes, and may they line up with your will and purpose for our life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much again for having me in your places. God bless. Shalom.